Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode is brought to you by Vettery, a hiring marketplace that connects job seekers and tech with the hiring managers from top companies in the U.S. And I had a chance to talk with Brian Levy, VP of product, about one of the most memorable and impactful things about the job seekers experience on Vettery. Every candidate on Vettery gets assigned their very own talent executive who guides them every step of the way. The talent executives is an internal team that works with candidates as they're coming on the platform, helps them fill out their preferences. We get on the phone with job seekers and talk through their backgrounds and what they're looking for in their career. And then once job seekers are on the platform, we help them look into roles and companies that they're interviewing with and talk through offers that they get on the platform in order to make sure that they get tailored offers that meet their requirements and their career goals. It sounds like you're holding a candidate's hand through the whole process. Yeah, definitely. Working with a talent executive is essentially having a personal career coach who can help you think through how does a job relate to your career goals? Like, what should I be asking for in an offer? What should I be doing to prepare for an interview? Uh, essentially what a career coach would do. So it's often a very isolating experience. Vettery has found a way to ensure that job seekers aren't alone in the process. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think that it's really something that we hear a lot from job seekers on Vettery is that working with a talent executive is often the thing that is most memorable and most impactful about their experience on Vettery is that they have someone to bounce ideas off of who can help them think through their career goals and decide, is this the right company for me? And um, if it is, how am I going to land this job? All right, take that first step, head to vetterycom slash changelog to learn more and get started. Also, our listeners get a $500 signing bonus when you find your job through Vettery. Once again, that's Vettery, V-E-T-T-E-R-Y.com slash changelog. Hi everyone, Tim Smith here, senior producer at Changelog. This week, we're bringing you a very special rebroadcast of JS Party, where Jared Santo and Suze Hinton talk with John Resnick. They covered how he's using GraphQL at Khan Academy, some of the mistakes and successes using GraphQL, his feelings on jQuery, and had John answer some community questions. Oh, yes, the sound of those beats means it's time once again for JS Party. Now, if you watch The Office, you already know that the first rule in roadside beat sales is that you put the most attractive beats on top. The ones that make you pull the car over and go, wow, I need this beat right now. Those are the money beats. Special thanks to BMC, that's Breakmaster Cylinder, for helping us put the money beats right up top. My name is Jared Santo, and I'm happy to be here today. We have Suze with us. Suze, sit and say hi. Hello, coming to you from sunny Hawaii. Suze, you're in Hawaii. I just got all jealous. Please tell us why. I'm very excited. Uh, This is the first day of my vacation, so I'm going to have a JavaScript party with y'all, and then I'm going to go and have a party on the beach. That sounds better than what I'm going to do next, for sure. (laughs) I'm very excited. I haven't, like, gone on a big sort of travel vacation since 2011, so I'm so freaking excited. Very cool. We appreciate you joining us from Hawaii and waking up extra early to kick off this party with us, but you had to be here for John Resig. So special guest of the day, John Resig, y'all know who he is. He's here to talk about GraphQL, how he's, why he's excited about it, why he thinks it's the new rest. John, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So let's just get a little bit of a catch up uh, with you and what you're up to these days. We know you've been working at Khan Academy uh, for a while now. Is that still your day job and, and what you've been up to? Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I've been at Khan Academy now for a little over seven years and yeah, so still working there. I, I'm, these days, my my role is as a, a front end architect. Uh, so thinking a lot about the you know systems that we're building, and you know uh, uh, you know thinking about hard problems about like you know what sort of things do we need to have in place and to ensure that we can you know write stuff quickly and be scalable. And but then additionally, you know, working on things like. Um, you know, sort of our like our design system and stuff like that. Mm. Um, so it's it's pretty wide ranging, but it's all very you know front end focused. So yeah, in that I uh, uh, I really enjoy it. I, I think I, 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 yeah, I, I think being there seven years is <laughs> probably testament to that. I, yeah, I, re- I really really like it. 
It must be so cool to see how Khan Academy has changed as well in both product and technically over the last seven years. I think that's really a wonderful opportunity to have when you're so happy somewhere that you actually get to really be there to, to influence it, to evolve, but also just watch the audience change over time too. Mm-hmm, absolutely. I mean, when when I started, there was, I think, three, like like I was the third engineer. Um, and it was very, you know, the, the whole team was incredibly small and, um, and then I, I, I forget how many users we had at, at that point. Um, but you know, at, at this point now we have, you know, tens of millions of users every, every month and from all over the world. And so like the challenges of scaling <laughs> up from, you know, those, those kind of tiny, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the tiny beginnings up to where we are now has been very monumental. And so anyway, I've, I've really enjoyed, at least for myself, like the, the, the technical challenge of working on these problems. But also, I really appreciate the sort of impact that we're having, um, you know, being able to bring, you know, educational materials to people all over the world for free. And you know, that's something mm-hmm. that I feel uh, I feel very good about. So uh, a little bit of uh, insight into some of that impact, at least uh, anecdotally with myself and my family, we're homeschoolers and we use Khan Academy extensively. And so we're very grateful for it. It's, it's been instrumental in teaching our children. So thank you very much for all your work there. Oh, well, fantastic. I'm glad to hear it. You're very welcome. Seven years, a long time in internet years, like that's eternity. It must be very satisfying to keep you there that long. Mm, yeah, definitely is. And it's, I think it's nice because, you know, kind of as, you know, Khan Academy, as Khan Academy has grown, like I've, I certainly feel like I've grown a lot too. Um, I think one of the reasons why I decided to work at Khan Academy in the first place is in, in, I guess this may come up later, but like when I joined Khan Academy, I stepped down from jQuery. Uh, like I left the project and yeah, I left it in good hands, but like I, I was deliberately wanting to move on to be able to, you know, work on a product you know, actually getting to, you know, ship something, get it out and out to users and, yeah. you know, ha- have that sort of flow in that process. And like, so that's something I've been really just enjoying and and really relishing. You'll be able to have excellent teams with people who, you know, uh, really good designers, you know, engineers, front end and back end, QA people, like, and just being able to work on and ship like really high quality stuff is, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so that, that's something that, you know, uh, I, I feel like we haven't always been able to do that. Certainly back in the beginning, it was much more loose and just, you know, everyone had to do everything, but now we're, you know, we're, we're larger ish and you know, we're still less than 200 people, but we're certainly a lot more professional and, and we're, you know, creating things that I, at the very least I'm very proud of. That's the dream. So, John, we have you here today, not to talk about jQuery, but talk about GraphQL. So Khan Academy was an early adopter of React, and now you have dove head deep into GraphQL. And you're so excited about it that you have a GraphQL guide, which is a seems to be an in-progress, but has some meat there book that you're writing with Lauren Sands Ramshaw. Tell us the backstory in the introduction, which we'll link up uh, in the show notes, the introducing the GraphQL guide post. You give kind of the insights into... Uh, how GraphQL was exposed to your team there at Khan Academy, and then some of the transition of like getting into it. Can you tell us that story? Sure. So at Khan Academy, I guess we take a very, I think, different approach to architectural decisions than maybe most organizations. So like my role is I, I'm a front end architect. I'm the front end architect. Um, but like I don't dictate anything about what we do or what we should be doing, what technologies we should be choosing. My, I sort of see my role as, as a facilitator. And so then, you know, if people are interested and excited about things, my job is to help them define it and refine it and, you know, get it to the point where we can start using it. So for GraphQL, that was a thing that had come up in a number of sort of a, a number of our front end guild meetings where we we have these you know bi-weekly discussions with all the front end folk there and we get to talk about things we're working on or interested in and GraphQL had come up a number of times. People had gone and you know and seen you know different talks on GraphQL or read blog posts and started to experiment with it in side projects. And it was at that point that we were like, hey, this is pretty interesting. I think I think early on we were 
you know, looking at a number of different technologies like GraphQL seemed interesting, Relay, and then, um, you know, Apollo came later on. And just like all these different things, it's like, okay, how do these playing together? How are these interacting? And how is this compared to what we're doing right now with our, our REST APIs? And, and at least for us, you know, like we have a lot of REST APIs, both public and private. And maintaining them was a real project. And it was really hard for us to kind of understand sort of the data requirements that we had. And that were that were uh, you know exist across all these different APIs. Um, so we we were we knew we were kind of interested in GraphQL, but we needed to kind of understand whether or not this was going to work for us. So what we ended up doing was a sort of uh, a number of experiments. Um, we 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 hold hackathons at Khan Academy, and so during the hackathons, we did some experimentation with trying out uh, uh, you know, GraphQL on parts of our website. And this was just, you know, it was not intended to ship. It just obviously, it's a hackathon. You're just doing something just to see if it, if it works. But in that process, we're like, hey, this is pretty cool. So sort of the next phase of that was um, I was on the classroom team last year. And so the, the classroom team is all developing products for teachers and students. and um, you know, in, in a classroom uh, setting. And in there, we were, we were going to be redesigning and redeveloping a number of our products. And I realized, like, this is actually a really good opportunity to experiment with using GraphQL. Because since it's a greenfield opportunity where, where, where we don't need to be relying upon existing REST APIs necessarily, we would be writing new ones anyway. So let's use this as a chance to, you know, define a GraphQL architecture uh, implement it and start using it for these new products. So in doing so, it ended up uh, it ended up working really, really well. Like as we were using this, we were just like, "Hey, this is <laughs> amazing! It's so much easier to use." Um, and then, like we started talking, uh, we on the classroom team started talking to other teams. We're like, "Okay, this is actually really legitimate." And we started to get other teams to kind of like start experimenting with with, with their architectures. And, and then eventually, after you know a few months of this, we all kind of decided um, and that this is actually what we want to be doing. You know that that yeah. GraphQL is um, it's just fundamentally so much better than what REST has provided for us. Um, so we were willing to you know put in the hard work of moving over, you know rewriting a lot of our APIs. Um, and all this, so like, like this is still very much an, an ongoing process. We, you know, we we sort of have a mandate now in place where we're using GraphQL for all uh, new things that we're writing, and we're starting to convert existing things over to use GraphQL. But it's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> like it, it just it's um, so we'll see. Well, I, I don't know when the day is going to arrive that you know one hundred percent of our REST APIs are gone. And we're using GraphQL for everything. I mean, frankly, we're not even to that point yet with uh, uh, React. Like, like we're still we still have some pages lingering somewhere on our website that are using like jQuery and stuff. So, like, uh, we yeah, there's the process of cleaning out technical debt is, is a long one. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, about how many REST APIs are you uh, talking about here? Do you have like you know give us an order of magnitude? Hundreds, thousands? I mean, dozens? I think an order of magnitude maybe may like in a hundred ish. Would be my guess, um, yeah, and stuff and stuff that is both you know public and private. So it feels like yeah, the GraphQL guide is aimed to be that missing manual that you didn't have when you went through this with Khan Academy, which is awesome because now other people can learn from this journey that you've been on. And I think it's also really refreshing for you to say that, well, this is an ongoing journey and, you know, because a lot of people feel that they have to do everything all at once and that can be really scary. So I think that I really appreciate that you wanted to go back and actually then create this missing manual. Is that sort of the thought process you had? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a couple of things. One is, is having a missing manual. Um, well, I think, I, th- I think there's a couple of things, which is that, I think when we when we started using GraphQL versus now, there was there was just a lot more documentation and tools now than you know a year and a half ago, which is the reality of pretty much any new technology. Um, but the additionally, I wanted I was I was very interested in getting people 
excited about this technology like I was and am. <laughs> and so like I want I wanted to not only have it have there be a new, you know, a, a, a good resource for people to to use, but also just that I feel like there there there's some work to be done to even convince people that GraphQL is interesting uh, in the first place. Um, I'm convinced, <laughs> but the, but yeah. So I think I think part of part of the the book as well is is just like you know explaining and 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 looking at REST APIs, looking at GraphQL, and looking at the the benefits that GraphQL provides. Um, so yeah, so that that's yeah, that, that's where my that's where my heart and mind is at. <laughs> It's always interesting seeing uh, large software companies uh, adopt these new technologies, especially when you know Facebook came out and announced GraphQL and released it. You know they had already had a successful track record with React, but then they also had Relay, and they you know they wanted everybody to use Relay. That hasn't panned out quite as well. But with GraphQL, I think you had early signs of success when GitHub uh, decided that GraphQL is worth them investing in. And now we see Khan Academy, especially yourself, John, writing a book about GraphQL. That's going to, I think, sway a lot of people to, if they were just saying, yeah, no big deal, to take a look at it. Is that some of your intention? And, and then why would, why would you necessarily want that to be the case so that it has a, a, a brighter future? I, so I think one of the things that has been most changing for me, and, and again, like I, have, I, I will say that I just have an extremely heavy front end bias <laughs> in everything I do. <laughs> I mean, I mean, perhaps understandably so. But to me, GraphQL is the most front end friendly, like sort of API mechanic you can have. Um, and so, so at least for me, the more GraphQL that's out there, the easier it's going to be for developers front-end developers especially, um, uh -huh. to interact and use different APIs. Like like the like when we when we use GraphQL and we're developing new products, the rate at which we can iterate and prototype is so much faster than with REST APIs. Because, you know, uh, at least with, with how we had our REST APIs designed, you know, you would specify your data requirements on the server side and say, okay, we need to get these fields from these models and pass them up into, you know, a JSON object and, and send it up to the client. And whereas with GraphQL, you're, you're defining your schema. You're saying, okay, these, this is your model and, this, uh, and what, what properties exist on it. And then on the client, you're, you're specifying and it completely changes everything. Now, instead of having to do some server side like if you want a property that's missing you have to change some server side code with the rest api then go to the client and then you know uh, change you know what the fields you're getting whereas now with graphql you can just do all in the client you just it, since everything's been specified in the schema you can just say hey uh i need uh the username here uh i wasn't getting it before but now i want it you just add it in and like there it is and like you so like in that way the, your ability to iterate and is is so dramatically improved and you can just get stuff out very fast and so that, and that's great for us like you know we're working with designers and we're doing a lot of like testing in schools and you know we can you know just try stuff out get it out there experiment get the results back and just keep iterating again and again um so yeah i think that's something that's worked out very very well for us This episode is brought to you by Raygun, who just launched their APM service. It was built with the developer and DevOps in mind. They're leading with first class support for .NET apps, also available as an Azure app service, and have plans to support .NET Core, followed by Java and Ruby in the near future. After doing a ton of competitive research between the current APM providers, where Raygun APM excels is the level of detail they're surfacing. New Relic and App Dynamics, for example, are more business 
oriented where Raygun has been built for developers and DevOps. The level of detail provided in the traces are amazing. The flame charts are awesome and allows you to actively solve problems and dramatically boost your team's efficiency when diagnosing problems. Deep dive into root cause with automatic links back to source for an unbeatable issue resolution workflow. Learn more and get started at raygun.com slash APM. Once again, raygun.com slash APM. So as you've been doing these iterations, has there been anything that's popped up that you didn't expect to run into with GraphQL, like such as the way you write schemas or even just um, like how those queries end up connecting on the back end? Or is there any sort of little pearls that, that came out of it that you could share with us today? So I will, I will mention that, that at least at Icon Academy, we, so I think we're probably different from most shops that use or would be using GraphQL, which is that our backend is on Google App Engine and we use Python for our backend. I suspect that probably a lot of people who are, who are using or would end up using GraphQL are going to be probably with a Node.js backend of some sort. I don't know what platform they were running on. But um, so, yeah, I think the, I, I think some of the things that we, learned were sort of about the differences in uh you know server side implementation and i think there's i think there may be some things that we are maybe a little bit envious now <laughs> of like like I, I i i've been seeing the exciting news and stuff coming out about like apollo server for example and all sorts of really interesting like caching mechanisms and uh, uh and, and th things like that that are there but you have to be using Apollo Server and kind of have it integrated in your stack. Whereas for us, that would be challenging to do. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I think, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't have a good answer to this at this point, other than to say that, um, yeah, if I, I suspect that if you're, if you're sticking in yeah, no jazz land, um, you're going to have a really good time. <laughs> and with, and, and if you're if you're kind of skirting out the edges like we are, like in, with Python and graphene and things like that, um, you we can definitely you can definitely make things work, and we are. It's just that it's gonna be it's gonna be a little bit different. And um, and like I and at Khan Academy, we're also starting to experiment with Kotlin um, as a server side language. And I'm not mm. sure what their GraphQL story is like, but it can't be better than what's happening in Python. I can almost guarantee <laughs> that. So yeah. So uh, so yeah. Anyway, I think the um yeah that's something that, that that we've been learning and actively learning but yeah I, I at least in my side projects where i've been using you know graphql it's been very smooth sailing and i've enjoyed that that's great is this something that you're covering a little bit more in your guide as well yes absolutely so yeah covering um me, you know many of the different client side implementations and many of the different server side implementations um you know we we do have a bias towards sort of the primary stack i want to say where a node.js backend and a front end that's using uh react um because th i think that's that's something that a lot of people are probably going to be using who are using graphql but we do cover a lot of the other options as well because you know it, it is that's the nice thing about graphql is that it's it's relatively generic like it doesn't nothing about graphql dictates that you have to be using react or using node.js um and and it, what's interesting is that, you know, like, like, you know, we're using Python on our back end and on our front end, we're actually going through old pages of our site and replacing REST API calls with GraphQL calls. And some of those pages are, you know, they're older, you know, they, they aren't using the latest, you know, Apollo and all these wonderful frameworks. Um, so, but we've kind of, you know, created little shims where we can stick these GraphQL calls in. And so it's, yeah, you, you can really make it work um, you know, wherever you want it to run, no matter what technology stack you have. So, yeah, I think, I think that's something that's, um, that's nice. And I think people don't necessarily always realize that. 
I can speak a little bit to the back end ecosystem because just as part of my work at ChangeLog and ChangeLog News, we obviously keep our thumb on the pulse of what's going around in as much of a polyglot way as we can. And I would say in the last 18 months or so, uh, across many of the different ecosystems. I mean, Node was was very early and uh, often in terms of tooling and support for GraphQL backends. Um, but I've seen a lot of advancements in the Elixir ecosystem in Ruby, um, as well as uh, Python. So there's there's just a lot going on, and a lot of the the different backend technologies are racing to get their tooling and support for building GraphQL APIs. Uh, as solid and, and quality as they can. So you've definitely seen a groundswell of support across different ecosystems. So John, w- what else from the front end? So this is uh, this is obviously where you focus. And so where the fo- a lot of your, 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 you said GraphQL was just so much better, like so much better than Rust from your guys' perspective. So I guess just, I know you've mentioned a few pieces of it, but maybe a chance just to sing its praises and enumerate uh, all the ways, you know, <laughs> let me count the ways uh, <laughs> that GraphQL has won you over on the front end, like what's the biggest wins and how many are there? So I mentioned rapid prototyping, but I think one of the things that so shocked me about uh, GraphQL is that when you have your queries defined on the client or you know, in your JavaScript code, um, you can statically analyze the queries. Um, so the benefit of this is that like, like we, uh, uh, we have, we have, you know, linting rules set up where if there are any changes to, you know, a GraphQL schema or something like that, and it doesn't, and, and it's going to cause one of our queries to break, um, and it, it'll error, it'll, it'll produce an error about that. Now, the cool thing about this is that it allows us to refactor our APIs or our, our GraphQL in ways that were never possible with our REST APIs. Because with a REST API, you know, or, or at least the ones we had, it was just like, okay, here's a JSON blob. Um, you know, we don't know what data is being accessed or how it's being used or where it's being used. Um, so therefore, we don't know if it's ever safe to remove any data. Hmm. Um, and so like, if we want to like rework our API and be like, uh, oh, sh- you know, let, let's, is, you know, can we delete this data? Can we rework this schema, et cetera? It's just, it's, an, it's a huge, very frustrating project. Whereas with GraphQL, um, you can do that static analysis and just be like, and, I, and I, we've done this where you're like, oh, shoot, I want to rename this property to be more descriptive. So you rename it, you run the linter, and you get a, a nice little list there of every file that's breaking now. You go through, make change those names, and you're done. And oh my so like, god! You know the refactoring <laughs> process. Sue's likes that. It, it takes minutes as opposed to well hours and things just breaking in weird ways that you can't quantify. Um, so this is something that is for me when I saw that I was just like, okay, that makes all this worth it. <laughs> uh. <laughs> like, you know, it, it's it, it's the sort of thing that. Um, is truly important. And now I think one of the one of the technologies we've been using a lot at Academy additionally is uh, flow with uh, flow types. So the nice part is that if you have you know this GraphQL data come in, you can define the flow types for the um, uh, for the GraphQL data structure, and then you can sort of trace a whole path. Uh, through your application so again you know like if we if we change the name of one of these props um you know i can just go change that in the flow type definition and now uh uh and now i can see every single place in my application that's breaking as a result of that so this sort of stuff that again like it's it's making refactoring possible in ways that really just weren't feasible before um, so this is something that that really really excites me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I th- I, th- I think other things that have um, I'm trying to think of other things that have excited me about from a, from a front end perspective about GraphQL. I think I've really enjoyed the Apollo uh, client side implementation. Uh, we we've been using it with with React, and it makes it really nice to. It, 
really understand things about like loading states, uh, error states, all this sort of stuff. It, and I, a good side effect of this is that it, it encourages you to write your React components in a way that are very robust to changes. Because you, you know, your data could be in a loading state or an error state. Like you have to account for that. Mm. Um, and I feel like in a REST world, it's very easy to write something where you're just like, oh, we're going to get some data and then like never handle the data failing. <laughs> and, right. um, and like in the Apollo world, I feel like you, you kind of have to do it. Like it's, it's defined explicitly. And especially if you're using things like flow types, um, you know, y- like you can verify, you, you have to make your code more robust. Um, which is good. It, it, it's it's better coding practices, frankly, and and so that's something that I've also really enjoyed. Is that like I feel like the quality of the components that we're building that use GraphQL are just better than what we were building in Restland because we're able to enforce enforce these really good practices from the start. Speaking of in like sort of enforcing things from the start, I had a question just about backend data and setting up databases and things like that. You're obviously on a journey where you're taking like existing data structures on the back end and you're getting it to work with GraphQL. Is there anything that people should do differently if, let's say, they know immediately from the get go that they're going to be using GraphQL? Do you have any advice on how back end developers could set up their databases and their data structures in the first place on the back end in order for it to be? Um, as easy as possible to work the GraphQL. I know that it's obviously like a very generic technology, but are there any sort of nuances in there that you can share? That's an interesting question. It's not something I've had a ton of experience with, honestly. But the in, in, as I've played around with GraphQL and, and, and experimented with it, it's, it, I guess it it's really felt like it's pretty, it is able to handle lots of different cases and lots of different database styles or querying mechanics. Um, it, I think generally it does work better or it's a little bit better suited to, um, you know, uh, just sort of, uh, you know, you know, document centric databases, you know, like I, I, like the, when I've gone through and implemented GraphQL on top of like, you know, MongoDB or something like that, it's, it's really, really simple. <laughs> it couldn't possibly be much simpler. Mm. Um, and uh, it's a little more work for something like you know if you're doing it on like a SQL database or something. But again, it's it's not it's not insurmountable at all. Um, so yeah, I think the yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't, I don't feel like I have very good advice here to give specifically. Um, and, I, and I wouldn't be surprised. This is something I haven't done much research into at, at this point. But I, it wouldn't surprise me if there are like people building just like you know, databases designed for GraphQL at this point, or, you know, kind of all in one uh, type of deals um, that are designed for, you know, performance and caching and all these sort of things from the get go. So you don't have to roll them on your own. Uh, But that's something I unfortunately haven't uh, done a lot of research into at this point. Yeah, I think there's a certain, you know, um, I think you're very lucky if you are actually entering now and you're starting something from scratch, which generally isn't always the very common case, right? Like unless you're a startup that just exploded onto the scene right now, you're going to be dealing with like transitions and things like that, which is very similar to what you're going through at Khan Academy. But it's it's good to know that um, there are some sort of cases um, or, or situations where it, it is a lot easier to get started immediately. That's cool to know. So from the front end perspective, and I've had a few of these conversations, uh, we can link up a few old changelog episodes, not even that old. We had a Prisma and GraphQL episode just this uh, spring even about GraphQL and uh, talked to about, about it with a lot of people. And it seems like uh, from the front end, it's, it's, it is demonstrably and uh, maybe even say objectively better in terms of, like you said, prototyping, speed of development. Um, I didn't realize this point about uh, refactoring, which is really cool. But it seems like on the on the back end, building the back end, dealing with caching, dealing with perhaps uh, inappropriate or like poorly crafted queries, it's like that's kind of where the there be dragons are. And I know you've been very much on the front end of the Khan Academy team, but has that been a real issue? Like it is... Put differently, like is the back end team or the people who are doing both as excited as you are 
Or is it like the front end is driving this and the back end is just like <laughs> along for the ride? Yeah, so it's interesting. So I think a couple of things that I want to caveat the work that we've been doing with is that so far we have not exposed our GraphQL stuff public. Okay. So like we, we have not replaced our public REST APIs with GraphQL yet. Um, that's going to be a process in and of itself. But the we are not letting people write you know, arbitrary GraphQL against our servers. Um, mm-hmm. I, I would be, uh, I, I think, I think that's something, you know, you know, if I remember correctly, GitHub allows people to do that. And I'm yeah. very curious to hear about how they do that in a way that um, they feel is safe. Um, but the, you know, we, uh, at least so far, that has not been a priority for us. Now, additionally, one thing that we do is we have lots of, you know, monitoring and logging for all of our GraphQL queries. So we track the performance of every query. Uh, you would track this performance over time. And then we have alerts for when queries are being especially slow. Uh, so then that way we can look at them and be like, hey, this query is taking like five seconds. That seems excessive. <laughs> you know, what can we right. do to you know, make this faster. And then so we can, with this data, we can delegate this to the teams to work on and approve. Um, but at least so far, w- what's interesting is that, you know, initially the the front end team, we were championing this. We're like, we really want this to make our lives easier. And like, at, but I think a, a, an interesting part about, you know, the GraphQL switch here is that the back end team now is very excited about this change too. Mm. And one of the reasons for this is that, it dramatically simplifies the back end because previously we would have, okay, we have a REST endpoint and you know, we're getting some information about a teacher and their students or something like that. Um, it, within that single REST endpoint is many different queries, you know, data being transformed and mutated and like all this sort of stuff. And then it, it, it gets mushed back into a JSON blob and put out. This code ends up being pretty complicated. Like it's hard to look at and reason about. And especially when you have a number of endpoints that are doing very similar things, but just getting data or displaying the data in slightly different ways. Right. But whereas in GraphQL land, since you define a schema, just a generic schema, this is the sort of thing that pretty much anyone can do. You know, like like you know, front end engineer, back end engineer. It's pretty. It's relatively easy to write these schemas. Um, and then once you have that, you don't really have to worry about the logic of you know m- mutating this data into a, a, a good form. You know, GraphQL just takes that takes care of that for you. So in a lot of ways, it's made our a lot of our data structures much much easier to understand. And and the backend team has been excited about that because it's reducing the surface area of the application. It says now they can just look at one place and be like, well, uh, the only place where this you know data model is being used is in this one GraphQL schema, and that's it. And we can just look at that one place and understand how it's being used entirely, uh, mm-hmm. as opposed to trying to hunt around the application to all the different REST APIs that could be using this thing. It just, it just, it's very, very complicated. Um, and so, yeah, so I think you know, this is something that they're seeing as, as a, um, a way to reduce the amount of code that we have and the amount of surface area and, and just, just simplify things overall. That's interesting. The, I find myself often, so I, I often do small teams or sometimes team of one style projects. So very often I'm, I'm, I'm the consumer of my own REST APIs. And so I only have to nag myself uh, for slightly <laughs> different data. <laughs> or, or a new endpoint, right? But I still have that mental back and forth of like, oh, I guess I need the data this way. I'm going to go add an AP, add an endpoint or adjust an endpoint to massage it to be better. And I have worked in a situation where I was contracting to build the backend API for a startup that had multiple devices, right? So they had a, a, an iOS app as well as a web app where the first two, they weren't quite successful enough to make it to their eventual Android app uh, situation. But in that circumstance, it was me, a contractor, working on the API and then a completely different company building the iOS app. And so a lot of the, if you, if you look at the bottleneck of development speed there, 
it is the integration point between those two actors and the slowdown when they are waiting on me or vice versa was was troublesome and i could see where if it was a graphql api with a well defined schema that a lot of the stuff that they were waiting on me for right waiting on back end for they wouldn't have to wait like they would just change the way the query worked and as long as the schema supported that then they would have been off to the races and so have you felt uh less communication lag or maybe tension between i don't know how big your teams are uh, if you have walls and whatnot between them i know some companies have very strong walls between teams what are your thoughts on that yeah so it, well, one thing i'll mention briefly is that we do have a front end team and back end team and we do okay. have people who are full stack and but the thing is like additionally we're it's we're, we're pretty porous <laughs> front end people are making back end changes back end people right. are making front end changes um, yeah, that's the way it should be right i think <laughs> and so like it's um, we, we aren't one of those super strict organizations. I think some people just may have preferences of just like just doing front end back end and as a result, they do less, but, um, and that, so, but yeah, I think the, certainly, um, I think, I think one of the things that's been interesting is that even, even in cases where a front end engineer has had to go in and add in an additional field to the scheme, um, I would say that it's just easier to do in general, even compared with how we have things previously. Uh, so even even in the worst case, um, where a front end engineer has to make back end changes, frankly, any any of our engineers is capable of that from our most junior to senior. Um, and I, th- I think that's something that is, it feels empowering. <laughs> you don't have to wait and rely upon, you know, getting a, a you know, a more senior engineer or back end engineer in to go work on this. But I think mm-hmm. I think the thing is that the far more common case is just like, oh, we're just missing this field, but it already exists in the schema, so we just add it in and now we're done. That's the sort right. of thing that is, yeah, the, the velocity impact is is tremendous. Um, and, and of course, you know, that that's helping the individual engineers so they don't have to go to the back end or wait on someone else to finish it, um, whatever the case might be. So yeah, it's it's been pretty great. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by Linode, our cloud server of choice. It is so easy to get started. Head to linode.com slash changelog, pick a plan, pick a distro, and pick a location. And in minutes, deploy your Linode cloud server. Get $20 in hosting credit. That's four months free. Once again, linode.com slash changelog. And by Rollbar, catch your errors before your users do. Resolve your errors in minutes. Deploy with confidence. Move fast and fix things like we do here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Head to rollbar.com slash changelog. Changelog once again, rollbar.com slash changelog. So, John, we have some really cool community questions um, from our JS Party slash Changelog community for you. So we're going to read some of them out to you on this segment. Okay. So the first question is from Dan McLean. Um, He says, without subscriptions, what's the benefit of GraphQL over REST? With HTTP2, you get muxing of connections, so the limit of open connections is higher, somewhat negating the benefit of grouping queries. And the pain point comes when one of those queries is slow in that group, causing your whole payload to be delayed until your slowest query returns, which is arguably worse than firing off 10 REST requests. So it, it... I think the first part was the question, which is like, what is the benefit of it over REST um, if you don't have the HTTP bottlenecks, it seems. So this is less probably about the the user experience, I guess, on the surface layer. Yeah, I think, so there's a couple of things. One is, is that um, GraphQL queries don't necessarily have to wait until everything is done before returning. Um, like I know that like Apollo and like, uh, with uh, and with like a policy server, you can do like in, uh, uh, like you can start to return data in batches. Um, so you you can you know get some of the you know initial layers of requests and return those and keep returning more as you get deeper and deeper. So like it isn't necessarily the case that it's an all or nothing proposition with GraphQL. 
certainly the simple implementation would be all or nothing. Um, but I, looking at a lot of the the different you know tech stacks that exist now, like Apollo Server, like they're much more robust and can handle you know incremental uh, uh, data. So, and I, I think the um, the, the I kind of I guess the sort of the question about performance. Um, so I think one of the things that is certainly a little bit tricky. And it's it's tr- one thing that's trickier with GraphQL than with traditional REST APIs is that I guess typically with, with traditional REST APIs, especially ones that aren't authenticated, it's a lot easier to do uh, client side caching or, or not client side, but like like you know uh, uh, browser based caching or H- you know uh, uh, caching at at an edge cache or stuff like that. Um, Whereas with GraphQL, since typically you have a single endpoint, um, it's hard to do caching at that level. The so usually what you end up having to do is either having a, a different sort of client side cache, like in in browser, um, and you know like we use Apollo, and in that case it, it caches um, the data that we've requested, and if it looks like we're going to try re-requesting data that we already have. It just pulls from that cache data, so we don't have to, um, you know, uh, uh, send off another request. And then, additionally, you can do caching on the server side, but it's lower level at like the software level. So you can see that you have certain queries coming in, and if you know that certain data is always going to come back, you can just return that cached response. Um, so yeah, so I think there there are definitely ways of um, doing. You know, improving the performance, improving the caching of GraphQL. Um, I think it, one of the things, though, is that it's just going to work in a different way than what typically happens with you know a normal REST API. So I guess as a side question or follow up for that, I guess it's more of a side question. Dan says without subscriptions, um, but he's now assuming that we all know what subscriptions are in the context of GraphQL. Um, can you explain what subscriptions are? Mm, sitting and try explain. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know. Essentially, you you can subscribe to a data source and get you know periodic uh, updates, um, and uh, you know being able to you know so that you know as more and more data comes in, it, it gets updated with that additional data. The subscriptions are a little bit different from what I was describing before yeah. with the Apollo server, which is like a single query, but then the data. The data that you're returning is complex. It's coming from multiple different queries, subqueries, and stuff like that. And in that case, that is coming back, could potentially come back incrementally as the data is ready. Mm. Um, whereas a subscription is more like uh, you would use a subscription to like implement like a chat room or something like that, or like you know like add where there's lots of updates coming in, or like you know a stock ticker feed, or I don't know something <laughs> something right. where you have like you know so it's more like a real time re- connection that gets a push get gets pushed data from the GraphQL server. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they, that's more than what the subscription is, rather than uh, the other thing I was describing. Yeah, gotcha. Very good. Okay, next question from the community. This one comes from. Dylan Sheeman, who listeners may remember from the Dojo episode back on JS Party number 25, uh, Dylan says, so jQuery, that's like a query language for GraphQL, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's funny because yeah, Dylan and I go way back because we're, we were um, you know, he, he was on, working on Dojo, I was working on jQuery, like, like all of us, you know, I guess yeah. at this point, old timer... <laughs> In JavaScript framework folk, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. So in our chat room, he mentioned that you guys have been trolling each other for years. So he thought that would be appropriate. Um, but I think it's funny. It's like one of those things where like we, you know, at, at the time it was like, it felt the competition felt intense or at least yeah. it did me, where it's just like, Oh man, we're trying to like change things and get recognition and like all this sort of stuff. And like, um, and then, but then like, as things have changed and as the world has changed and everything we're just we're, we're kind of now we just get to look, look back at those times and be like oh yeah that was that was a thing <laughs> that was happening and uh but yeah no it, so it, he did it, he did follow we'll, oh go ahead oh uh, sorry one, one thing i will mention though is that he's jokingly saying this jake rated thing for creating graphql databases but like back when i named jQuery, my my first name was uh, j select 
mm. and just for like JavaScript select. Um, right. And, but I couldn't, the domain was taken. So I, I didn't choose that. Uh, and okay. I saw that jQuery was available, but there was an open source project called jQuery. And it was like a Java library for like doing SQL queries or something like that. And, and it looked like it hadn't been updated in a while. So I was like, okay, it's probably fine. I can just, I can just use this name. I, I the domains available. I'll get the domain and I can use it. And then I remember at some point late, oh, sorry for saying, yeah. No, no, keep going. Sorry. As I say, at, at, at some point in the future, the domain, the, the, the person running the open source project got in touch with me. It was like, Hey, you're kind of using my name. I'm like, oh, sorry. Like, I thought the project was dead. I didn't realize that it was, like, still going on. <laughs> um, but the thing is that, like, yeah, obviously, I, 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 I feel pretty certain that, like, yeah, uh, web-based jQuery is far more popular than the jQuery Java SQL querying thing. Right. <laughs> so, but, but, yeah, I, I did feel a little bit bad about that. <laughs> This is such that a actually, classic naming problem. You know what I mean? Like, is the domain available? Is there already a project called this? You know, these days it's like, is is the name taken on NPM, you know? <laughs> right. The age old programming problem is naming things and cache invalidation and off by one errors. OK, so Dylan does actually have a serious question following up on his troll, which actually plays into some of the stuff you're talking about there, John, about jQuery. So uh, he says he's curious to find out what you think of jQuery's place. In JS history now, do you have regrets with the project? Would you go back and focus more on architecture type problems with jQuery before things got out of hand for people trying to build large apps? Or do you see it as a good bridge for people from the days of old to the VDOM based dev? I do see it as a relatively good bridge. I mean, it's it's certainly of its time where, you know, jQuery was so DOM centric. Like you are you know, querying DOM elements, manipulating those elements directly. It, it, it certainly whenever I do stuff like that, like that these days, it feels very antiquated. <laughs> and, um, and I think the, I don't know. I, I don't, I've, personally, I don't, I don't have regrets about miss, you know, not doing, you know, architectural things. And it's, and it's not because, I feel like I missed out is, is that at the time I made very deliberate decisions not to work on that. And like, we knew that jQuery was not, it, it was not, it was opinionated in some ways and that, you know, this is ways of querying DOM elements and, and things, but like, it was not opinionated about how you built your application. You could build it in any way you wanted. You could use jQuery in that context, but we weren't dictating how that should work. Um, so I think the, I'm okay with this. Like I, and, and like, if you look at like react and I think, you know, it was mentioned earlier that, you know, we were early adopters of react at, at Khan Academy, but we were, I believe the first organization outside of Facebook to use, to adopt react. Um, and you know, react is just so dramatically different from the jQuery way of doing things. I don't think we could have ever have iterated on jQuery to the point at which we arrived at React. It just it's it's just, it's just a fundamentally different branch of the evolutionary tree. <laughs> and and frankly, I feel like React is a lot better for the kind of things that it's trying to do. Um, and you know, uh, these days, like I'm as a as a front end dev, I feel like I'm much, much happier trying to build the complex things that I'm trying to build than I was a long time ago. And it isn't necessarily because of jQuery, it's just because that we as an industry have dramatically changed how we're doing things and what we're willing to consider to be acceptable. Um, and I think it, it's, it's such a, you know, the industry is growing up. <laughs> and, and a part of that is, um, you know, having, you know, you know, a lot of these frameworks that take care of things for you. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't have regrets about it. I think jQuery was, was great. It did a, it did a very good thing for a lot of people. And yeah, I certainly enjoyed using it. <laughs> and, and, and really that's when I first created it, that's all I wanted. I just wanted a framework that would, uh, solve my problems. Um, mm. um, so yeah, but the, um, 
Yeah. No, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> I sleep fine at night. <laughs> <laughs> As you should. Our next question comes from Luis Montez. Uh, it relates a little bit to Dan's question earlier. So it's about like REST versus HTTP and um, the advantages outside of that. So um, they ask, since we've had things like JSON RPC over WebSockets for years, how much of the GraphQL as the new REST, quote unquote, comes from REST being typically tied to HTTP while GraphQL is transport agnostic? I think that's a great point. Um, they're asking, is the query language itself the killer feature? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the the query language is really good because a lot of the features that I describe you know, are benefiting directly from that. You know, being able to you know specify the query the, the the query on the client side, being able to you know do static analysis, you know, all these sort of things. Um, so that's certainly a benefit. I think addition additionally, you know, having a schema defined on the back end. Uh, you know, so like you have the schema in the back end, the queries in the front end, and like those two together really make GraphQL what it is. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't think the transport layer. Frankly, I don't. As I'm developing and using GraphQL, I don't think about how things are, how it's getting to the client necessarily. Uh -huh. um, you know, like that's not my primary concern. My primary concern is more about okay, what data am I requesting? Is the data that I need? And they, I've, so yeah, I and I feel pretty good about that. Yeah. So they, yeah, I yeah, I think so. I guess to answer your question, yeah, I would agree that probably the query language itself combined, but then combined with uh, you know the, the the schema definitions is is really what makes GraphQL special. That makes a lot of sense. Next question comes from Chris, aka Canada Uni, in our JS Party chat room that Chris was just talking about an AeroPress project uh, to learn Apollo stack with GraphQL. We were talking about coffee during the break, so uh, Chris is very much into that conversation. Uh, Chris has a thought, a question, and a concern, so I'll kind of give them to you in that order. Uh, the thought is it was really easy to set up a node server with the new Apollo server, so good to hear that. Uh, the question is, when should someone not use GraphQL? Um, so, I mean, personally, this, and, yeah, this is my opinion. I don't I'm not convinced yet about using GraphQL for a project where you are the only developer working on it. Like if you're just building a thing for yourself and you're doing the front end and the back end and everything, like, like you can probably get some benefit from GraphQL, but I think that you, there's going to be diminishing returns. Um, I think you're going to get the most benefit from GraphQL when you're on a team of engineers. And you're like trying to all share and use the same API. Um, additionally, I'm also not sold about using GraphQL for a public facing API. Uh, I know there are people who do it and more power to them. It just seems like an unnecessarily complicated <laughs> uh, thing to implement, um, uh -huh. especially since you're letting people run semi arbitrary queries against their data. Um, that's the sort of thing that you need to be very, very vigilant <laughs> about. Um, so yeah, I think those are two things that, at least to me, I still have questions about. Um, and uh, yeah, I, but but I, I, at least the more common case of excuse me, uh, 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 having a team of engineers, you know, working against a single GraphQL endpoint, it's amazing. It, it couldn't be better. Um, and, and in that way, you know, rest is really, uh, it looks a bit inferior. <laughs> mm. Finally, Chris shares a concern, which maybe you can just react to or not. Uh, they say sometimes it feels like there is too much magic making it challenging to troubleshoot sometimes. Maybe that's just with Apollo. Um, but that has been my experience. Mm. Interesting. Uh, I'm trying to think of like issues that we've hit as we've, like used Apollo and stuff. And we have it hit some, I think the, the issues that we've hit have been more like when we're like upgrading, um, you know, like moving from one version to another and things start breaking in ways that we don't understand. Um, this has only happened maybe once or twice so far. And it just requires a little bit of debugging and trying to figure out like how, you know, different state is, is moving around in different ways. I think the, 
a, usually issues like that are happening if, if they happen at all are happening in like the very complicated parts of our application. Um, so maybe that also kind of speaks to us that, that, that we should just be, our applications should, should be simpler, <laughs> but, but the, uh, and then therefore it'd be e- easier to uh, reason about. Um, but yeah, I don't have much wrong. Yeah. So our last question is from Rasmus Hansen. Um, and they ask, what are some common mistakes people make when working with or implementing GraphQL? Hmm. I, I, I feel like I don't have enough data looking at like what people, like people at large, what mistakes they've, they've made. Um, I think the, I feel like there are mistakes that, that we made. <laughs> yeah, we would love to hear that. Yeah, personal anecdotes would um, be amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I think one of the, the uh, I, I mentioned earlier about how we have like tracking set up now for the GraphQL queries to know how long they're taking. And that isn't something that we had initially, nor was it something that came out of the box. And that's a thing that's helped us a lot because we were having a hard time figuring out which queries were taking a long time and why, and or even understanding which queries might get slower given the different parameters that get passed into them. Um, so that's the sort of thing that is, um, I'm, I'm not sure it's a mistake that we made other than that, like as we were using GraphQL, we were kind of realizing that like, we just didn't have the information that we needed to write good queries. And so we kind of had to build an additional layer on top to like do this analysis. Um, trying to think of other mistakes that we made. Hmm. I think, well, I should say one mistake that we, I feel like we didn't make <laughs> and, uh, but like we could have is that we didn't adopt GraphQL too early. Um, like I think now is now is probably, um, you know, the best time to be adopting GraphQL. Uh, you know, we adopted a year and a half ago, you know, it was, it was certainly rougher. I think if we had tried to adopt GraphQL when um, it first like started coming out and being all buzzwordy and all that, uh, we would have had a real hard go of it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I think, I think from a mistake perspective, like my, my takeaway from this is that like if I'm starting a new project today, I'm just going to go straight to the latest and greatest things like i like i'm going to use apollo and the uh, uh both in the front end and back end personally and and because like their full stack just kind of it takes into account a lot of the edge cases that exist so i think it would definitely be a mistake today to kind of like roll your own thing from scratch um there's really no reason to do that uh there's a lot of good frameworks to take care of this for you so that, that, that thing that's, I think that's probably my, my main takeaway right now. That's great advice. Well, that rounds out our community question and answers. Thanks to all the awesome community members who submitted those questions. Thanks, John, for hearing them. Final thoughts from you, parting words, John, as we, uh, before we let you go. Oh, I don't know. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, <laughs> it's been nice getting to, getting to chat about this and, um, uh, yeah, I guess I guess a message to anyone who's listening is yeah, definitely uh, check out yeah, check out GraphQL. I think it's pretty great. I think it's uh, at the very least worth some time investigating. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, no, I think that's about it. But yeah, thank you. And also, if people want to check out uh, your GraphQL guide that you're currently in the works with, uh, they can actually get the beta right now, right? So if they go to graphql.guide, is that the best place for them to start? Yep, yep. You can go there. You can uh, you can pre-order and get access to the full uh, beta book as, as we're working on it. Yep, and they're both, both um, online and uh, eBooks as well. Yeah, I'm excited. I see that as compatible with Kindle. And like, I just, because I travel so much, my Kindle is my best friend. That's where I get all my reading done. So that's great. Excellent. <laughs> Very cool. Well, that is our show. Suze, thanks so much for joining me all, all the way from Hawaii. Hey, go hit the beach and uh, enjoy your vacation. Will do. It looks like no one is there right now because it's so early. So I'm very excited to get out there. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Yes, please enjoy. And one last word before we let y'all go. We will be at JSConf. So look for the JS Party t-shirts. Look for 
Many of our panelists, I believe, Suze, will you be there? Yeah, I'll still be in vacation mode. So if you see me wearing lots of tropical looking attire, it's because I've just come back from Hawaii, but I would definitely be there and I'm very excited. Awesome. Very good. Suze will be there. K-Ball will be there. I believe Nick and I think for Ross as well. So we plan on having stickers. We plan on having t-shirts. Uh, might be first come first served on those. And then also there will be a live JS party from the JS Conf stage. I think on the first day. So stay tuned for that. If you are going to JSConf, hit us up. We would love to connect with you. And that is our show for this week. So thanks so much for everybody. And we'll see you next time. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. You can find more episodes of JS Party at changelog.com slash JS Party. Rate, recommend, or review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you to our sponsors, Vettery, Raygun, and Linode. Bandwidth, as always, is provided by Fastly. Learn more about them at fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to linode.com slash changelog. Music is by the incomparable Breakmaster Cylinder, and the show was edited and mixed by myself, Tim Smith. Thanks for tuning in. See you next week.